Hi. Welcome to Drinking the Kool-Aid. Welcome. I'm Megan. I'm Hannah. And I have such an interesting story for you. Do you? Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Okay, so I will tell you that I read a super great article in New York Magazine. So that's where I got most of the information for this one today. Okay. Uh, But I also grabbed some from the blog of Demi World Podcast. And I also found another article that was called The Drag Queen and the Mummy. Okay. (laughs) Uh, And Happy Pride Month! Yes! (laughs) So that's one of the reasons we're covering this story today. Listen, I just talked my whole family into buying tie-dye chairs, basically, so. They're rainbow! (laughs) Yep. Whoop whoop. <laughs> and I already bought my pride stuff at Walmart. There you saying. go. <laughs> okay, so we start off our story with Dorian Corey, who was born Frederick Legg and lived on a farm in Buffalo, New York in 1937. Uh, she was witty, humorous, well liked, and everyone said she had the gift of gab. A friend of hers said that she just helped you laugh and forget your problems. Love it. (laughs) Right? She was everybody's angel. People that knew her say she was theatrical and could just do anything. She worked as a window dresser in a department store. And then she started doing drag before moving to New York City to study at Parsons School for Design. In the 60s, she traveled as a snake dancer, so she had, like, a boa constrictor yes. in the cabaret drag show, okay? That is amazing, okay. <laughs> by the 80s. I love that so much. Right? <gasps> yeah. So, like, by the 80s, she was an extremely popular drag queen in New York City Vogue ball scene. One of her friends said she was very talented and could, like, paint her ass off, but She was an entertainer first. She held over 50 grand prizes from voguing balls, and she ran and designed a clothing label called Cory Design, where uh, she sold to the ball world and the local community. Holy crap. Yeah, she was doing a lot. (laughs) Uh, She was also the house mother to her own house, the house of Cory. Dorian had an act that involved wearing a 30 by 40 foot feather cape. Oh, what? (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Holy crap. Okay. (laughs) And when she took the cape off during her shows, it would be raised up on poles and it was a tent that would cover the audience. What? Like, who thinks of that? That's so cool. And how do you, like, walk? (laughs) I have no idea. I can't even I can't even walk with like regular clothes on without falling or doing something stupid. Like let alone a tent that covers an audience. What I'm saying. A whole ass audience. That is insane. (laughs) Okay. Well, she was known for her extravagant and elaborate outfits. She had dresses like chandeliers, centaurs, wolf women, and Marie Antoinette complete. With a guillotine. Oh, okay. (laughs) Okay. Okay. So, uh, she performed most often at Sally's 2, which is a Times Square drag club. Sally's hideaway had a serious fire in 1992, so Sally moved the club a few doors away, and she was like, okay, this is now called Sally's 2. Okay, actually, that's amazing. Yeah, it's actually, it's super cute. Like, why not? It's kind of brilliant. (laughs) Yeah. One of the things that Dorian Corey is most known for is her role in a film called Paris is Burning. Uh, Here's the description on that from Wikipedia. So it says, this is a documentary that chronicles the ball culture of New York City and the African-American, Latino, gay, and transgender communities involved in it. The film explores the elaborately structured ball competitions and explores how its subjects or how its subjects deal with issues such as uh, AIDS, racism, poverty, violence, and homophobia. 
It documents the origins of voguing, which is a dance style where the competing ball walkers pose and freeze in glamorous positions. And the film explains how words such as house, mother, shade, reading, and legendary gain new meaning to describe gay and drag subculture. Whoa. And so it actually sounds really cool. And yeah, I do want to watch it because I it's do. very intriguing. The apartment that Dorian lived in was on West 140th Street in Harlem. The neighborhood was actually a really bad part of town, and there was a lot of riffraff going on. The apartment was filled to the brim with fabric, feathers, sequins, beads, headdresses, tailpieces, and elaborate <laughs> gowns. Yes! <laughs> Dorian Corey was the real deal. She was a legend. When filming began for Paris is Burning in 1987, some of it was actually done at Dorian's apartment. During the very first shoot, there was a gun battle outside. What? So. <laughs> like, legit? Legit. Like, a real one? Oh, my. Okay. Like, some of the crew okay. members had to lay down in their van so they didn't catch a bullet. Like, okay. that's legit. Okay? Yeah. Uh, Dorian did end up moving about 10 blocks down afterwards, and she would have friends over all the time for, like, Scrabble, and they said she always had a TV on in the house or in the apartment somewhere, like, background noise. Yep. Same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Podcast or TV, something's yep. on. I gotta have something. Yeah. Now, Dorian did pass away from AIDS when she was only 56 years old. And the New York Times ran a picture of her in drag, which was the first time they had ever done something like that. Dorian went on one last tour, but was hospitalized during the three years that were leading up to her death. She slipped into a coma and died several days later on August 29th, 1993, at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in Manhattan. She was cremated, and her remains were scattered in the waters off City Island, New York. Okay. I know you're confused. I'm really... Because <laughs> you think my story's done here. No, well, I'm just like, what? Where I know that can't be the end, so where is this going? Okay. Uh, the end. <laughs> All right, so Dorian's friends had been instructed to take whatever costumes they wanted after her death, and then they could just sell the rest or give them away. Her friend and caretaker, Lois Taylor, brought many people over to the apartment to buy, you know, various items. Uh, she brought two men into the apartment who were looking for a Halloween costume. Lois was later interviewed for an article by Jeannie Russell Kassendorf, and Lois said, quote, Child, it's what Dorian told me to do. Take the costumes I wanted and sell the rest. So I had customers. They were going to a Halloween show. They asked Lois if this was a ball, and she replied, quote, No, no, no. It was straight people. They wanted Dorian's capes. She was one hell of a seamstress, honey. One time she wore a gold cape that covered the whole ballroom floor. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the two men looked through the dresses and the costumes, but they couldn't really find anything that would work. Uh, they wanted a black cape for a vampire costume. So maybe not as elaborate as the stuff Dorian right. has. <laughs> While the men but were I searching. Love that, like, I, sorry, I love that you just like really went in your inner self over there. Child. <laughs> <laughs> I was like waiting for the opportunity and I didn't want to like wait too long to say it, but I was cracking yeah. up. Honey, <laughs> it's like, damn girl. All right. I have to imagine that's exactly how it was coming out. I feel like you're probably correct. <laughs> that's how it sounded in my head when I was reading it anyways. Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> um, so while the men were searching, they spotted a large garment bag and they asked if they could look inside. It was one of those old timey type cloth bags that you would put a suit in and then fold it over and it was green plaid. Lois went over and she tried to pick it up, but she couldn't. And she told the New York magazine, quote, I only weigh 135 pounds. I couldn't lift that thing. <laughs> now, <laughs> remember, Dorian's outfits are extravagant and huge. So right. Lois thought 
Like, there's got to be something damn good in that bag. Maybe, like, a heavy beaded gown. I mean, honestly, that's legit, though. Especially when you're wearing something that can cover a whole freaking audience. Exactly. And you're like, ooh, something's hiding in there. It's so good. So she handed the men some scissors, and they cut the bag open, and one of them was like, Ah. oh, my God, there's a scent. It said that they all thought it was maybe, like, a dead dog. And Lewis said that she ran like hell and called the police. And that's like the best, <laughs> honest to God, that is the best probably reaction I've ever heard so far. Yeah. And she says, quote, because, honey, I wasn't chancing it. And that's exactly <laughs> right. That is what you should do. Yeah. <laughs> Don't chance it. <laughs> uh, she was asked if she saw how the body was wrapped. And she says, quote, no, 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 child. After the cops came, I didn't go back there. You look at something like that, honey, that's something you won't get over for the rest of your life. Yep. I love the way she talks. Seriously. I love the way you're doing it. (laughs) Well, thank you. (laughs) I guess the theater years paid off, huh? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's what it is. There you go. Uh, The body was halfway between mummified and decomposed because... The body had been covered in baking soda and wrapped up in, like, fake leather-type material and then taped. That's peculiar. Right. So they had no idea who the person in the bag was, but obviously it's now a murder investigation. Uh, There was flip tops that fell out when they pulled apart the layers of the wrapping, and it's like these little rings from old flip-top beer cans, which haven't been used since the 70s. I was, I'm, what is a flip top? Um, so it, on the beer cans, it was like this little circular top that comes right off of the beer can. Oh, okay. And I would assume that, you know, it was probably like a big littering thing too, because you're pulling them off. Where are they going to go? Probably on the ground. Right. Uh, So yeah, they don't use it anymore. So the um, forensic specialist, Raul Figueroa, said he was asked, like, if he thought the person who wrapped the body in leather was maybe trying to copy the Egyptians. And he said, yeah, because, you know, maybe. And he said, quote, I don't think so. People just wrap a body in whatever is available. It's just spontaneous. You wrap it up. Then you put it in a suitcase, then you put it in a closet, then you just look at it periodically and wish it would go away. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, that's accurate, too, I guess. Right. <laughs> wow. Um, How many bodies do we have out there that people just wish would go away? <sighs> I'm hoping not a lot, but he made it sound like it. <laughs> he was quoted a lot in the article, like the New York Magazine. And they used some very interesting tactics here. So to figure out who was in the bag, he said, quote, So I cut the fingers below the second joint, and then it took me several days to work on it because technically, even though it says mummified, he was in a mummified state, but in a soupy sort of mummified state. Oh. <laughs> okay. When you have all this wrapping, no air is getting to it. But it's still losing liquid out of its body, so the body sort of floats in its own soup. There was Mm. all this muck, many pounds of muck. You have to clean it off, but you gotta do it soft because you don't want to destroy it. It's a painstaking sort of process. The minute it gets destroyed, you do the wrong thing, it's gone forever, and then you got nothing to work with. So I was working on secondary skin, the lower one, beneath what you see. Secondary skin slippage, you've seen a floater Uh, come out of the water. No, (laughs) no. You've seen the hand, like a glove coming off. That's the slippage. Ah! The secondary skin. It's not as pronounced as your regular skin. It's a twin of what you might lose in a sunburn or regular wear and tear. Um, That was awful. (laughs) That was awful. Skin slippage. Okay. Skin slippage Stop is uh, disgusting. Stop it! You said it again! You said it. I, yeah, but you said it too! <laughs> it's absolutely disgusting, but 
I just love the way that he talks about it. I don't. Oh, okay. I hate it so much. Well, I hate to tell you that I've got another full quote from him. No. Does it include more <laughs> skin slippage? Let's find out. Sna- Wait. Oh, my gosh. Why does it always have to be like some creepy body sludge or body soup or skin slippage? I feel like somehow Ugh. these stories just call to me. Ugh, okay. Well, so. that's great. <laughs> that's real great. Yep. Mm-hmm. If people don't want to hear it, they better find more stories and tell me what they want. Okay, well, <laughs> are you people listening? <laughs> mm-hmm. So, Raul Figueroa says, quote, So I had to come up with something to try to be able to deal with the fingers. Because of the skin, it was... We all have microorganisms that either were near the body when he was enclosed or on the body itself. They will eat through the skin, leaving these micro little holes that you can't really see, but where you can't inject anything because it's going to leak out. Very slowly, but it leaks out. So there's not much you can do. If you try to put ink on that, it won't adhere to the skin. It was a problem, and I ended up Well, I can't give away secrets because it's beneficial to us to keep it more or less secret. But I worked out something and I was able to close those holes. Then drying, which is a common known thing with acetone and a variety of other things, drying the skin, then using a little bit of heat. You might have to soften it, put it in special liquids to soften it, and I was able to secure the print. When the body was examined, the skin was so thin that it would fall apart if you touched it. So they spent seven days treating the skin just so that they could take the fingerprints. And the skin had to be hardened into leather. Uh, and Raul Figueroa put the skin on his own fingers Mm -hmm. like a glove over his latex Mm -hmm. gloves, inked them, and rolled them for the print and was able to get all 10 fingerprints with this method. Hmm. Aren't you fascinated? It's very fascinating, <laughs> but, ooh, yeah. Okay. Skin just... Falling off everywhere. And being put on by somebody else. Just He had to wear his skin fingers. Ah! <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Skin sl- skin slippage, body soup, and wearing fingers. That's, that's, this is some, um, been interesting so far. I told ya. <laughs> well, a match was made, and they discovered that the mummy in the closet was Robert Bobby Worley. He was a black man born on December 18th, 1938. And he had been arrested in 1963 for assaulting and raping a woman, so that's why the prints were in the system. According to court documents, Robert forced a woman into a vacant store below his apartment and raped her. The woman lived right around the corner from him, so it's possible that they knew each other somehow, but that, I mean, that doesn't matter. Robert was arrested hours after the crime and was charged with kidnapping, assault, and having intercourse with a female, not his wife, against her will and without consent. Wowza. Yeah. Uh, He claimed that he was just drinking some wine with the woman and he didn't know what happened. Wow. Right. Mm. Not very creative. Didn't know what happened. I don't know what mm. happened there. I can't even Um, get started on that. Three weeks later, he pleaded guilty to assault and was sentenced to two to four years in state prison, and he served three years in Sing Sing. Some of Dorian's friends believe that Dorian and Bobby were seeing each other. Maybe Bobby couldn't accept the fact that he was into Dorian because she was biologically male. Or Bobby may have believed that Dorian was born female. And then he got angry when he found out the truth. These are just a few things that people have kind of tossed out there. But it's basically a self-defense theory here. In an interview with Bobby's brother, Fred, he said that he actually was not surprised to find out that his brother was dead. (laughs) He's Uh, like, he's a dick anyway. (laughs) Well, 
<laughs> Essentially. Yeah. So he said that the family had not heard from him in a long time. So they, I mean, assumed something happened. And while they didn't initially think murder, uh, they thought it was maybe going to be a medical situation. He had complained about seeing blood in his urine at one point to them. Oh, that's probably not good. Right. Might want to check that out. After they found out that his body had been discovered, the family let the city bury him in Potter's Field on Hart Island. Like, they didn't really do anything. They're like, oh, you can have it. Oh, all right. Yeah. We're already over it, so go ahead. Right. Um, so the brother actually confirmed that Bobby was a very heavy drinker. And sorry, I think I switched a little bit there between Bobby and Robert. So same person here that we're talking about. Okay, okay. The family calls him Bobby. Okay. So he was a very heavy drinker and had massive rage issues. So it's possible that he got into a fight with Dorian and, you know, it ended up with him being shot. Right. Fred said that. Bobby actually moved in with him and his family for a very brief time after he was released from Sing Sing, and he had changed his name to Robert Wells. One night, Bobby calls the house, but clearly thought he was calling someone else, and Fred said that his brother was drunk off his ass and he just sat there and listened to him for a while. But he was able to gather that his brother was in a relationship with a trans woman. And he says it was Dorian. Dude, I've literally been on the other end and other end of those drunk calls, like where I'm just like, okay, I'm gathering as much information as I possibly can get right now and trying to piece together what's actually happening. Sure. <laughs> Um, Fred openly admitted that he would not be surprised if his brother was beating on Dorian and said that he had, like, a really macho attitude and was very violent. Oof. So. Okay. Yeah, I think that it's just. That's rough. Yeah. And when they're kind of like, well, I'm not surprised. (laughs) Right. That Uh, makes sense. That adds up. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. Right. And Bobby's brother did explain that he had a son. Um, so Fred is saying Bobby had a son that he abandoned. And Ooh, okay. Right. So that's not it just great. Um, keeps getting better and better. Yeah. I don't know, maybe better for the kid. I don't know. I mean, I would say so, yes. Hopefully, hopefully the kid was with someone great. But uh he says that while he was living with Fred. He became infatuated with a woman next door, and then she refused his advances. So he went over and, like, roughed up her seven-year-old son. Oh, ah, uh, excuse me? So we're really not dealing with a great Absolutely the here. fuck not. Yeah. What does the kid know? The it, kid has nothing, nothing to, to do with, with anything. It. Right. No, I know. And do you think that she's going to be like, oh, now I'd love to go out with you? And nor does it matter that she said no. How about you back the fuck off and leave her alone? Because no means no. So the woman threatened to call the police, obviously. And then he, like, just peaced out. He was like, gotta go, leaving town. Many of Dorian's friends were interviewed about being in that apartment over the years. And not one person could imagine her killing somebody. And they never smelled anything. And so, like, this apartment, remember, I told you there's, like, costumes and stuff everywhere. Right. She's a damn seamstress. So Dorian was doing fittings for people all right. the time. Well, and I feel like when you have, um like, thick clothing like that around, too, that smell would, you know what I mean? You Get feel like in that there. would smell would, like, cling to things. Right. And one of her exes used to stop by all the time. And he said that neither him or his German shepherd ever smelled the dead body. Not even the dog? No. And he said they were there often. Or maybe the dog smelled it and was just like, meh, he was a douchebag, so I don't care. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think a dog knows that, but okay. You know. I don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> the person that had obviously been in the apartment the most, at least towards the end of Dorian's life, was... Lois Taylor, the caretaker. She really wanted to distance herself from this, though. And when Dorian was dying, 
Lois asked her if she should get in touch with her family, and I guess Dorian told her, hell no. <laughs> okay. So that's not great. All right. Uh, after she died, Lois found old letters in a file cabinet that Dorian and her, uh, her mom were writing to each other. And this was when Dorian had first moved to New York. Her mother knew about her new life, but didn't tell the rest of the family. Okay, that so, sucks. Like, as in didn't tell them because she didn't want them to know? Yeah, I don't okay. think that she condoned Got it. how Dorian was living her life Super and who she really was. Yeah. Okay. So Lois found a phone number in the papers and she called it. And used the name Dorian had been born with, uh, Frederick, when she called. She was like, I'm calling about Frederick, so they would know. And Dorian's sister said she had been searching for her brother for 30 years. Whoa. Right. So that sucks because maybe the siblings would have been fine with it. Yeah. You know, and that was taken away from them. Yeah. Everyone that knew Dorian said she was not a violent person, but she was someone you don't fuck with either. They felt that she could, you know, resort to murder, maybe if she was really, really provoked. It was also rumored that she could have been framed. Now, here are a few theories. And just to let you know, this is an unsolved case. We have nothing here. Oh, so, thank you. <laughs> but we've got some theories. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, people think that maybe Dorian hid the body to keep somebody else out of trouble. She could have been covering for someone. Um, that doesn't necessarily make sense to me, but there it is. Um, the other one is that maybe somebody framed her by placing the body in her closet after she got sick. Now, this, it could be because, again, nobody ever smelled the body and they can't explain how on earth it got there. But this theory is mainly about Lois Taylor, the caregiver. People think that she was the one that planted the body in the apartment after Dorian died because... Dorian obviously couldn't get in trouble for it. She was, and Lois made a big deal about, oh, I'm too small to lift the bag. And she was present when the body was discovered. Okay. There's also another thing about Lois Taylor. She found a handwritten short story on old yellow paper that she claims she handed over to the police once the mummy was discovered. It was a story that she said was written by Dorian, so she finds this in Dorian's apartment. And the story was about a man who wanted to get a sex reassignment surgery to make their boyfriend happy, but the whole affair ended in revenge. So people wonder, could this be a real story? Well, the police say they never received this. So it's another reason why people point the finger at Lois Taylor. Okay, but also, like, the police claim they haven't received a lot of things that they have absolutely yes and they somehow suddenly lose entire things of evidence and you know right. you know all that good stuff right Ugh. right and maybe she found the letter and didn't hand it over to the police mm, who knows that's a possibility because maybe there was something in there like that she didn't want them to know about I don't yeah because she know. openly in the article talks about this specific letter so she's claiming that it exists and she right. said that it really showed her a clear picture of what happened she was like that is a confession but again the police say they don't have it hmm. so odd it is uh some people say that the body could have already been in the apartment so like surprise dorian moves in and there's a body waiting for her uh, remember, she had to move 10 blocks to this new apartment, and so they're like, oh, maybe she accepted her new mummified roommate because she didn't want to go to the police. Oh, I feel like that's a little far-fetched. Right? Because, like, why would you invite a body and just be like, you know what? I'm just going to live with you for, yeah, you know, however long now. Here we go. We're good. Well, now, here's the thing. 
she was a black trans woman. That's valid. And so some people wonder, like, if she were to stumble upon this, would she go to the police? Because they're not going to really the, believe her. One, yeah, the police might go after her for that. Yeah. So, that would be, su- yeah. While I still don't buy this theory at all, I really don't, I can see that point. Yeah, I can. Okay. Uh, the medical examiner said the body could have been dead for one to 25 years due to the varying states of mummification and decomposition. It was, like, too difficult to get an actual time right. frame. So, like, what if it was years prior? Yeah. And that's why nobody smelled anything? Right. I mean, but you still should have because it was soupy. I don't know. I mean, I Yes. But it was soupy inside of yeah, the leather. I suppose. So who knows what that changes. I suppose. And it's got, you know, it's covered in like the baking powder. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, another theory is that Bobby tried to break into Dorian's apartment and she shot him in self-defense. She lived in a rough area with lots of crime and it makes sense that she had a gun for protection. One of Dorian's friends named Topaz stated that Dorian had purchased a 22 pistol from her. This was an unlicensed gun that was used in a previous murder and they needed to get rid of the gun. Oh god, okay. So, it was used <laughs> Okay. Holy shit. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just really did not expect that. Right. And another gun that was used in a previous mor- murder. We just need to get rid of it real fast. Exactly. And again, here with this one, you know, Dorian, black drag queen. Would the police buy like a home invasion self-defense story oh, God, even no. if it was true? Right. And several sources say there was a note with the body that says, this poor man broke into my home and was trying to rob me. But, <laughs> Funny enough, investigators say they don't have this note. Wow, they just don't have any of the notes. Right. So, did it exist or did somebody make it disappear? Uh, I don't know. But uh, um, when Bobby was found in the bag, he was only wearing boxers and I think it said like a t-shirt cuff. So if he was trying to break in, I would be very curious to know why he only had his boxers on. I'm going to guess he was doing other things that he absolutely should not have been doing. Right. Yep. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. A friend of Dorian's claimed that she confessed to the murder on her deathbed, but this would have been while she was heavily medicated. So it's unclear... If, like, all of the words were coming out clearly and she truly confessed. Or if she said something that afterwards they were like, oh, that makes sense. That was a confession. That's really, yeah, that's hard to say, honestly, because that is so easy to convince yourself that Mm -hmm. that's what you heard. Exactly. So, not sure. And the thing is, is the police did interview this friend and nothing came of it. So, yep, I don't really think that there is much to that, but who knows? Uh, And then Dorian Corey and Bobby Worley may have, for real, been in a relationship, like a secret one. Dorian's doorman said that the two of them were together, and he saw them going into the apartment many times, and he also said that Bobby was abusing Dorian. So, if that's true, maybe a fight broke out and then she had to defend herself. I don't know. I don't, yeah, I'm, there's a lot of, wow. Yeah. (laughs) There's really just so many things that could have happened. Yep. And it's so frustrating because you can't ask her, like, what the hell? Right. Was there a body? Yeah. Chilling in there? If I had to sort of guess a little bit based off of, the very limited information we have. I'm curious to see if you are kind of, like, in the same boat I am. Well, the thing is, is he's in his boxers. Right. I think that something happened yep. where it was either a sexual assault or a physical violence type thing. And based on, like, his past. Yeah, he's clearly had 
issues with that. He beats up seven-year-old kids and, you know, rapes women. And even his brother is like, I really wouldn't be surprised if he was rough and dory and up. Okay, so you, we're definitely, like, I'm, leaning towards yeah. the same theory. Okay, I'm cool. thinking it was a self-defense thing. I'm thinking it was, too. And especially since nobody in her circle can even imagine that she would ever do something like but this. But then, given her situation, she's like, well, there's nothing, you know, I can do about this because they're going to think that, yeah. you know, they're going like, to be away locked for, up yeah, for and sure. lose everything yep. that I've built. Yep. So, yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm guessing. Man, that's a doozy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So make sure to follow us on any of your podcast apps. Tell us the stories you want to hear. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Leave us a five-star review if you love us. Tell your friends. Tell your cats. Um, Bye. bye.